we're the first in the world to be able to make a linear generator. There's no mixed fuels. You take the water, you turn it into hydrogen and oxygen, it expands. That expansion, just like making water into steam, that moves the piston back and forth and creates electricity. But now, once that's happened, you still have the hydrogen and oxygen. So now you ignite the hydrogen and oxygen for a second round. Nobody's ever done this before. Nobody's ever done this before. So this is a linear generator that runs 100% hydrogen oxygen, and it just uses the pressure to be able to make that electricity. All of this Biden inflation tax talk, what's it really about? And more importantly, what's the actual effective inflation on the lives of real people? Joe Biden claims that it's indisputable that his jobs plan is working. This data unequivocally shows that it's not. Well, at least for American workers. Rather, inflation is surging. And more than wiping out any wage gains these workers might have experienced... And historically, when inflation spikes, commodities like gold, silver, lumber, and real estate surge. Learn how simple it is to add physical gold and silver to your portfolio ahead of the rise in inflation and predicted price rises. Patriot Gold Group has the No Fee for Life IRA, where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver, and you may be eligible for the No Fee for Life IRA. Call one 800 Three five six four four seven zero, and get a free investor guide today. And with the knowledge that Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs' top-rated gold IRA dealer from 2016 to present, click on the link in the description box below for more information. And now on with the video. And good afternoon, everyone. Tom Ross is back with me today. This is part three of our talk about the future of hydrogen, how it's going to be implemented through the society, where the adoption is going to occur first, and how this will actually change what we understand as energy, energy usage, energy infrastructure, and with the Great Reset in play right now, in the real future where the real changes are going to happen on the ground that will affect their lives in many ways. So, you know, talking about hydrogen, we've been hearing about it more and more. So to have somebody present it that that's knowledgeable, industry expert, understands where the changes are going, how they're going to manifest, and then how it can be utilized across society to change the society. Cryptocurrency is part of this, but we're going to be moving to new energy systems. On-demand hydrogen is where it's going. Tom Ross here from Tesnik.com. Every time we have a talk, they've had great leaps forward in terms of approach by governments, private industry saying, hey, what's this hydrogen on-demand technology? Adoption in the mind of people realizing that it's, it's real, finally. It's not just something on a paper. It's not just theoretical. It's real, it's usable, and it's in our fingers right now. So, Tom, I appreciate you joining me again. You're just jumping right ahead to the hydrogen economy and cryptocurrency in places. That giant leap between continents as well. So give us an update on what's been happening. Sure. And thanks for having me on. And thanks for all your listeners to going back and forth with us. Really appreciate this and, uh, and this opportunity to, to share with people what you were getting to earlier, which was when you go to the pump, like here in Canada, it's going to be 40 cents on the dollar over the next few years per liter for the carbon tax. Uh, what? That's, that's outrageous. It, it is. It is. So convert to those of you in the States, that's a dollar sixty tax per gallon just for the tax on it. For the carbon tax on top of the already taxes for the federal, the state, local excise taxes on top of your fuel, an extra dollar sixty per gallon. How, how are motor fleets going to operate? How are the trucks going to bring your goods in? Oh my gosh, like how much is that going to increase the price from the farm gate all the way to the supermarket, for example, for food? If you're trying to pass on those costs all the way, and then what about the equipment that's in the fields, plowing, tilling, harvesting, processing? I mean, how much is it going to drive the price of everything up? And for me, you know, I'm always concerned about the food, knowing that food's a very important part of our culture and society and civilization. No food, no civilization. But if you're going to drive the cost up that much for the carbon tax, just to even move it from point A to point B, 
I hate getting drug over a bed of nails by an elephant into this next clunky system that's not going to work and doomed to fail from the beginning of electric economy. I mean, they kept us on this petrol economy, this hydrocarbon economy for over 100 years. And then now suddenly they just love us and they want to switch because they care about the planet. Finally, after 100 years of pillaging, digging, blasting, destroying, deforesting, polluting the waters and everything else in between. But now suddenly last year they start to care. And now suddenly we're going to have to revamp everything with entire new infrastructure, all electric and everything you've ever seen in your whole life. Just reverse it and, and switch it to electric. And then they're going to rake you over the coals for that much tax because the conversion there for a liter to a gallon is what I was trying to get at for the state side listeners. Absolutely. And where that carbon tax is going to obviously is to be able to subsidize the new green plant, which is the hydrogen electric vehicle. So if you look at this, pull away out from this from a perspective of say your Exxon, say your Shell, say your Porsche, say your Formula One, they're now using hydrogen engines. They're making completely designed just for hydrogen combustion engines. And they also have, uh, I sent you some videos there. They're now promoting e-fuels. E-fuels, I thought was just a funny marketing thing, but at the end of the day, it's actually produces a lot of electricity to make synthetic fuels. It's been made since, you know, the first world war, uh, but they've not been cost effective because the cost of getting the hydrogen out of the water and then taking the carbon out of the air, carbon sequestering, carbon recapture, uh, which is getting better and better by the, by the moment and more and more government money going into it from your, your taxes. And then you have, you have to combine those to make synthetic fuel, which is super clean, super, super clean uh, and completely carbon neutral because you're, you're taking it out of the air and then you're putting it back into the air. So it's neutral. And during that process, you can make synthetic diamonds, you can put it into concrete. So you can actually put some of it back into the ground so that you can negate what's been done in, in the past, to back things up a bit. So that's where people are going. MIT has uh, carbon sequestering where it's just a bunch of plates with an electromagnetic field that uh, works really well. So that's where the world's going. But Tom, wait a second. It takes a factory to produce those plates, does it not? So see, then we get into this whole illusionary circle of efficiencies in the CCS. You know, if you're going to store it underground, that's carbon capture and sequestration where they take it out of there and push it underground, CCS. But, you know, it seems like a big joke rolling around because everything that they're talking about as a solution needs to be do produced in a factory at the moment to create the solution to say, hey, we're so woke that we need this solution. But wait, we got to use a factory smelting heavy metals. And then nobody talks about refining how much nitrogen they use in the refining process either. You know, you're going to crack the molecule bonds. You're going to be using some nitrogen to pull different materials out of there. I mean, it's such a ridiculous thing happening. And I'm so happy you have a solution that jumps beyond the ridiculous into the usable. You know, uh, the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. So working with the oil industry right now, you know, like Porsche and Formula One and Exxon are now like Formula One is entirely exclusively using synthetic fuel. So it's a next step. So right now, how do you make the existing fuel cost less and have less impact on the planet? We're able to do that in a huge way, very easily at the end user. You don't have to rely upon them or what they're ever going to do. And that's the important part. Step two, synthetic fuel is the savior is what they believe for the oil industry, because they want to be able to show you that you can have all the conveniences of a internal combustion engine and keep the existing fleet that you have, but drastically reduce the emissions by 80% and your fuel consumption by 30 to 50% with the existing fuel. By adding this hydrogen oxygen box, which is what you can do because we need the economics right now in the world really needs some changes in economics. So you've got the first step is making that happen. The next one is a synthetic fuel. And then after synthetic fuel is something called a linear generator. And we're working with a company out of Europe that's funded by the European government. And they're working with large combustion engine companies, big brands you would, you would know. And the company's called Libertine. And we have a, a, a signed agreement with them. And there's a press release coming out very shortly to be able to show that the next step for us is you take the water and you turn it into hydrogen and oxygen. And when you do that, it expands because it comes, becomes a gas. That gas goes into linear generators. So linear generator is really just like, say, like one piston that's horizontal. And then it has a bunch of magnetic fields around it. And the piston goes back and forth and breaks those. And then it makes electricity. 
So that's a linear generator. Bill Gates has invested in one of the, you know, one of the companies and stuff and so on. So, so it's, it's become a big thing. Hydrogen linear generators are big things. We're the first in the world to be able to make a linear generator. There's no mixed fuels. You take the water, you turn it into hydrogen and oxygen, it expands. That expansion, just like making water into steam, that moves the piston back and forth and creates electricity. But now, once that's happened, you still have the hydrogen oxygen. So now you ignite the hydrogen oxygen for a second round. Nobody's ever done this before. Nobody's ever done this before. So this is a linear generator that runs 100% hydrogen oxygen, and it just uses the pressure to be able to make that electricity. So that's when you get to the point where anything new that's made or turning your existing vehicle into a mild or light hybrid with an alternator in wheel motors or replacing your transmission, whatever it looks like for a roadmap to get there, we're gonna be able to do that. Like you can get an old Prius today, a gen two, a gen three, and you can get the aftermarket kit to make it so it's a plug in and get the extra extended battery. And on 11 gallons, you can look this up, on 11 gallons of fuel, a Prius will go a thousand miles. Getting to the, to the light hybrid with existing fleets will be the next step where you electrify it, not just put the hydrogen in to reduce the carbon and the particulates and stuff and so on. That'll be step two. Then there's gonna be a mix of people out there that are gonna have synthetic fuels. But then there's also a lot of like hemp and other products out there that are these vegetable oils type stuff. And those are becoming a lot easier to come across right now. So you'll be able to put that in your vehicle and, and, and use that as well. So it's gonna be a big mix in the world. But once you get to the linear generator, you're looking at electricity for three cents a kilowatt hour with very small devices decentralized on demand. No storage, no transport. That's the World Series. That's the ring. You've, you've done it. But we got to get from here to there, right? So let me stop for a second. You know, last time we spoke, uh, I was telling you that I've been getting generators together out of my farm out here. And the, the amount of research that I did, I went for smaller units and then I could couple those together with a parallel kit because using the fuel you have to generate electricity, even at, if you're down at a fuel efficiency at 25% or 50% through the evening when you're not peak loading after an emergency, you know, the realization is we only, only have so much fuel. And once you burn through your fuel, you are out of electricity once more. So our last conversation was talking about kits that could go on top of generators to extend fuel life and working hours of generators, emergency generators. You know, this is just another whole facet for my crew and a lot of people listening to me are focused on the preparation aspects, knowing that, A, we're going to need to grow our own foods. We're going to need to process our foods, store it, dehydrate it, can it, whatever it might be, thinking more of in a pioneering lifestyle but using modern technology to increase that quality of life, even though you're at a pioneering lifestyle, if you have electricity. So walk me through putting something on top of a generator. Cause the reason I didn't go above 5,000 Watts on a generator was just sitting even at 25%, you're still burning through multiple gallons for in a six hour period that that's unacceptable. Cause maybe you only have 30 gallons in your house. You need to stretch that out. So I was down at the 2000 uh, watt, but then getting parallel kits. So if I was going to run on a minimum charge, I could disconnect everything else, turn all the other generators off, and then just run, run one simple one for the super basics. And then when a charge needed to increase, just plug them back in and fire up a second one, let them cool down during refueling, et cetera. That was my main focus was stretching every molecule out of a gallon of gas to produce electricity in a grid down or emergency situation. Preparedness of emergency is stretching fuel supplies. So for me, hydrogen add-ons to generators is also on my radar as an essential for getting ready to prep out for emergencies. So walk us through that because this is kind of a new concept and I know a lot of people really want to hear, hey, I never heard about this. You could put something on top of a generator to increase fuel efficiency. We're working with uh, uh, some students from Earth University in Costa Rica that worked on a pilot in the past with Cummings Diesel to make it so that uh, farmers in remote areas and uh, they just wanted to boldly sell Cummings Diesel motors and tractors where they'd never sold them before because 
the access to fuel was just was it just it, they couldn't get it. So they made it so that they could make their own vegetable oil fuels to be able to put into these things. Uh, so it's it's been done before. The the thing is now is can I get access to it and what will the price be in the future? And as they start to do what they've done here with generators is standby generators and full-time generators for remote communities now have to comply. They used to be exempt for the emissions. This will freak you out. This took me a long time to swallow this one and go, this is not possible. They can't do this. So if you're on a indigenous reserve here in Canada, and we're, we're part of a group called Indigenous Clean Energy, it represents 350 million indigenous people worldwide. We're a technology partner and help train and help them with this stuff. You know, you're bringing fuel, you're flying in fuel. Uh, it's like, now you have to put emissions controls on this that cost more than the original cost of the generator and you're going to consume 25 percent more fuel obviously the economics are being squeezed with this regulatory stuff where they're saying you know what um whoever's selling this stuff to me better come up with something better because i'm just not going to do that so they're trying to get you to go to water wind solar batteries whatever it is and they're subsidized from this squeeze but it's not really there for a lot of people that just don't have access to the lending or the capex or they're small like a native reserve so for us we can put these devices on and we can also show them how to be able to use multiple sources for these fuels because we make lazy oils into high grade fuels in the combustion chamber instantly with very low emissions so we're able to make it so they can use their existing stuff right now and what they were faced with was an impossible capital expenditure that didn't make any sense. They could never do it to comply with the new emissions. Number two, they were going to have to budget for 25% more fuel consumption for the electricity. That's not going to happen. Okay. Especially after that capital expenditure. So the Delta between us and them is a 40% gain versus, you know, option number one, option number two is us, right? You're talking about a capital expenditure where the return on your investment with a diesel generator on a native reserve would be about three months. Now, that's something you can finance and somebody's going to help you with. That's not hard. And you've got an additional 20% fuel savings and you can use lazy fuels. So you can start making your own fuels from whatever. You know, it doesn't matter. Any type of vegetable oil will work fine. Now you can become self-sufficient. So it's like you said, it's not just about savings. It's about how do I keep the lights on and how do I get access? Where do I get the source from? You know, like in your case, we can set you up with a kit so that you can make your own fuel and be self-sufficient. Yeah, because it seems like this over-regulation of our lives, even if you want to become self-sufficient, there still needs to be a tax associated with your self-sufficiency. And those out there that are trying to become more self-sufficient and get on systems and solutions that will allow the greatest amount of autonomy. Now, I know you can't completely unplug that. That's a near impossibility. But getting toward the cusp of almost everything we produce, we can consume. And the reason I, I tell you about this is in Tennessee, there's an excise tax of 25 cents per gallon that you have to pay even if you produce your own biofuels. Now, that's up to the first uh, 1,000 gallons. And then after you exceed 1,000 gallons of production, they give you your first 50 gallons for free. Oh, so generous. But anything after uh, 50 gallons of biodiesel production that's burnt in your vehicle then you have to pay the uh, 25 cents excise tax on it back to the state. And if you exceed a thousand gallons of production, you're considered a commercial refinery operation where then you need, you know, all the safety equipment and everything that would be regulated in a regular refinery. Like, nobody can afford that. Nobody. Because at that point of regulation and inspectors coming through and fire suppression equipment and storage tanks and this, that, and the other and berms. So if there's a spill and it just, it gets far, 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 far beyond, but if you're going to work in the real world, farms go through thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons of diesel every year. If they're out there plowing and harvesting and doing field work and they're running uh, diesel trucks with that in addition, because I use my truck as a backup when we're clearing part of our field out here. Uh, we use tarps and we throw things in the back and we run it to a fire pile. The average farm is going to use far more than that is allowed legally for you to produce as biofuels, which is just such a slap in the face when you want to come and be self-sufficient, you have all these ideas and then, oh, no, 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 you're making too much of it for free. And then, you know, this is where we start to get some of these, you know, so it looks good on paper, but in reality, 
you know, we're starting to hit a few brick walls here, there and everywhere. 